Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where two friends discuss cases that involve corruption and negligence from the people that we are expected to trust. These cases range from the police ignoring protocol to corporations placing people's lives in jeopardy in order to maximize profits. Today, I'm going to be drinking a mocktail strawberry daiquiri. How about you, Jenny? Right now, I'm having a margarita, my favorite drink. (laughs) (laughs) And trust us, you are going to need a drink to deal with this case. But don't drink too much because it is a long one and there's a lot of details, so you got to pay attention. (laughs) Um, So today, we're going to discuss a lesser known case, the 1992 disappearance of 14-year-old Misty Copsey. This is kind of a passion case for me, I would say. I first heard about this case through Georgia Marie on YouTube. She makes really great true crime videos and mystery videos. And something about the photo she used for the thumbnail really drew me in, this photo of Misty. She just, she looks like such a sweet, innocent girl. So how frustrating is this case for you? This case stood out for me because it was like the police were not trying to solve this case. It was like they were trying to find any reason why Misty caused her own disappearance. And that made it an extremely frustrating case to look into and to read about. But I also think it's a very important. Let's get into Misty's story. Buckle up because there's a lot of people involved, lies, and poor police work. Misty Copsey went missing after attending the state fair in Puyallup, Washington on September 17, 1992 with her friend Trina Breedlard. Misty was a smart and popular teenage girl who loved sports and was said to have been very friendly and goofy. She had a crush on Jason Priestley and she liked pretty boys. She was an only child and lived with her mother, Diana Smith and the two were said to have a good relationship. She had convinced her mother, Diana, to let her attend the fair without adult supervision, under the condition that she'd have a ride home, since Diana would be at work. She was kind of like a home health aide. Um, She was a caretaker for a very elderly person. Misty had planned on getting the 840 bus home to Spanaway, Washington, but missed the bus. At 845, she called her mom at work asking for a ride, but Diana was unable to do so. Misty said she would call her 18-year-old friend, Reuben Schmidt, but her mother had told her to find another ride and call her once she had. Diana came home from work and realized Misty wasn't there. Diana retraced Misty's steps and called everyone Misty knew, including friends and family. She spoke with Reuben Schmidt, who claimed that Misty did call him, but he was unable to give her a ride because he didn't have enough gas in his car. Diana really did not like Reuben. She believed he had sexual feelings for Misty after overhearing him make vulgar comments to her over the phone, and she did not approve of them being friends. Again, Reuben was 18, and Misty was only 14. Misty was not at all interested in him in a romantic or sexual way. Diana and Misty had recently moved from a trailer park to a suburban townhouse, and Reuben had been a neighbor of theirs at the trailer park. They stayed in touch especially because Reuben had a car that Misty knew she could take advantage of. Diana didn't fully believe Reuben's statement, though, and went back to speak with him a second time. He wasn't at home, but his teenage roommate was. And the roommate told Diana that he remembered Misty calling Reuben and that he had left with his uncle shortly after, assuming Reuben was on his way to pick her up. She spoke with Reuben once again, and he told her that his roommate was wrong and that he and his uncle went to a party that night. Diana was also able to speak with Trina Brevard. Trina lived in Sumner, which was in the opposite direction Misty was headed. She told Diana that she had parted ways with Misty on Misty's way to the bus stop, and she hadn't heard or seen Misty since. In her research, Diana also learned that Misty had spoke to a bus driver at around 9.20 p.m. and that the bus driver gave her directions on which bus would take her close to home in Spanaway. Diana called 911 to report Misty missing, but was told she had to wait 30 days to report her as missing. Until then, Misty would be considered a runaway. She later called Pierce County Sheriff's Department and was told she would only have to wait one week. However, since Misty went missing in Puyallup, the Pierce County police couldn't do much without their approval. This jurisdiction thing is so strange to me. I know it exists all over the country and internationally, but the fact that police wouldn't want to cooperate with other law enforcement agencies makes no sense to me. From the start, the police were suspicious of Diana. 
In all missing children's cases, they need to investigate the parents, but they found out a lot of information on Diana that ended up hurting Misty's case. Diana had had an issue with alcohol and had several DUIs. She had also previously reported Misty as missing, but that was due to a miscommunication. It turns out that Misty was actually in her room and Diana just hadn't seen her. Diana never told the police that she had found Misty after reporting her. Diana had also committed welfare fraud when she continued to receive assistance despite the fact that she was working. She received a deferred sentence for this crime. Diana was open about her past, but her vices and criminal activity led police to believe Misty ran away because she was tired of living in a dysfunctional home with a drunk mom. After Misty's disappearance, two of her classmates were interviewed by Sergeant Herm Carver of the Puyallup Police Department. Remember this name because he plays a vital role in this case. The classmates claim to have seen or spoken with Misty shortly after her disappearance. He took the word of the girls and used this as evidence for the theory she had run away. Because of these accounts, police actually closed the case and refused to reopen it. Sergeant Carver actually went on a local radio show claiming Misty had run away and that her mother knew exactly where she was and that Misty was safe. This caused the initial search of Misty to end. Years later, one of these students admitted to lying after speaking with Misty. Though Diana was frustrated with police, someone else stepped in to help her find her daughter. Corey Bober was a local man who had come across a missing person flyer with Misty's face on it. Bober was obsessed with the nearby Green River Killer case. Uh, For those who don't know, the Green River Killer was a serial killer that killed between 40 and 50 sex workers and runaways in nearby King County, Washington. We now know that Gary Ridgway was the Green River Killer, but Corey believed the killer to be a local man named Randy Axiger. Corey and Diana spoke regularly, and he believed Misty was murdered and could possibly have been a victim of the Green River Killer. He also believed her disappearance was connected to the murder of two teenage girls that went missing in Puyallup in the years before, Anna Chibatnoy and Kim DeLange. Bober believed there was a pattern with their deaths. The girls were killed two years and one month apart. Bober actually went as far as to warn the police that another girl would likely be killed soon as it would follow the pattern. Although some people do wonder, was this really a pattern? Because there were just two girls and it was two years and one month and and two people. That's not necessarily a pattern. Um, Remember, Misty went missing in September, two years and one month after Anna was found dead in August 1990. Deputy Brian Coburn of the Pierce County Sheriff's Department was now in charge of Misty's case. Bober and Diana spoke with him, and Coburn reportedly said that if he found Misty's whereabouts, they'd be the last two people he would tell. What is the benefit of this if this is what he truly said? This is her mother that she lives with, of all people to say that to. Right, and the weirdest thing is, it's such an arrogance. And honestly, someone who's being really malicious and vindictive, and I'm not sure why. Yeah, exactly. Uh, This didn't deter Bober, who kept researching and pestering the police. But unbeknownst to him, the Puyallup police were actually working on a drug case against him. Uh, Bober was a weed dealer. But the threat of a possible four-year prison sentence didn't stop him from working to find Misty. After bailing out of jail, he went right back to the search. If you couldn't tell, the police did not like Bober and actually convinced Diana to get a restraining order against him. She did end up getting the restraining order, but she dropped it in November, just two weeks after she had filed it. Diana began to realize that Bober was doing more for Misty than the police ever did. Bober wasn't just an amateur detective. He had also connected to Diana to a support group, and they had a kind of connection. They were associates. They weren't really friends, but... This is a very caring thing that he did with her. She was a grieving mom. She was struggling with addiction throughout Misty's disappearance, and I'm sure that did not make her life any easier. Despite this, Diana still did have her suspicions of Bober. Bober was known to go on long tangents and really force his ideas on people. 
At some point, Bobert had actually gotten an investigator to tell him the location of Anna and Kim's remains. And it turned out both girls were found off Highway 410, an area known as a dumping grounds for the Green River Killer. So, again, this is really going into Bober's theory that the Green River Killer did it and Misty was probably killed by him. After learning this, Bober then started search parties for Misty in the location in November of 1992, which all resulted in nothing. Finally, in December, three months after her disappearance, the Pierce County Sheriff finally reopened Misty's case and considered her missing under suspicious circumstances. But still three months later, the police hadn't spoken to Trina or Reuben. But Diana did run into Reuben at a local grocery store, and when she tried speaking to him, he ran away into a truck that was driven by an older man, who she assumed was his uncle. Diana claims that Reuben pointed at her and that the man's eyes grew wide and they quickly drove off. So, that's not suspicious whatsoever, right? (laughs) No, not at all. People just tend to run away from other people. In January 1993, Diana, Trina, and King County Detective Jim Doyon appeared on a local news show. Doyon had investigated the Green River Killer and the murders of Kim and Anna. During the broadcast, a woman called in claiming to have seen Misty walking down a main Puyallup Street in the direction of her house at 10 p.m. This was new evidence. However, this woman was never interviewed by the police, and we don't know who this woman was. Doyon did seem to take an interest in the case, though, and actually did his own unofficial six-hour search of Highway 410. Again, this is where the bodies of the other murdered, of the murdered Puyallup girls, Kim and Anna, were found. Uh, And this was after the disappearance, and again, this search turned up nothing. So Bober was wondering why everyone was searching what was wrong. Why wasn't anything coming up? Because his theory was right. Uh, And it turned out that he was searching on the wrong side of the highway. Kim and Anna, the missing Puyallup girls, had been found on the south side. And he had been searching on the north side of the highway. So after realizing this, Bober set up a search on February 7th and shared this with the local news, hoping to get some type of reaction from the killer. So Bober thought letting uh, the media and the possible killer know, hey, we're going to be looking in this area, he thought that the killer would leave some type of evidence there as kind of like a taunt to the police. So on February 7th, about a dozen people came to search the south side of the highway, including Diana and Bober. There in a ditch, Not far from the highway, they found socks, underwear, and a pair of Diana's jeans. The pair she had given to Misty to wear to the fair. Ooh, I got chills. (laughs) The findings left Bulber elated, which made the searchers uncomfortable and suspicious. Detective Doan was notified that Misty's clothing was found in King County and found Bulber suspicious too. He had, after all, taken a search party to this area and worked with the media in hopes the killer would leave evidence. When Detective Doan did his search a week prior, he had been on the correct side and found nothing. He did admit that he may not have looked as closely at the area off the highway since Anna and Kim's body had been found further into the woods beyond the highway. Forensic analysis also showed that Missy's jeans had likely been in the dirt for an extended period of time and not recently planted. Despite their suspicions, Bober had a good alibi. He had called the police the night of Missy's disappearance because he had been assaulted by a neighbor. The next day, search dogs traced the area and found nothing. Missy's jeans were forensically tested and later showed hair, fibers, and several small red paint chips. These results actually came much later because forensics were so backlogged in this area. It should be noted that years later, these paint chips ended up getting lost and that no police department have asked for the hair to be tested. Because why would they? Why would they show Mm -hmm. a basic level of competency to have all pieces of evidence forensically tested? Yeah, especially now. Hair, you know, it's so easy to get a DNA sample from hair. 
Later in February, Detective Dewan interviewed Trina Brevard. He was the first law enforcement officer to do so, and this was five months after Misty's disappearance. She confirmed that the jeans and the socks that were found were Misty's and said that Reuben was supposed to be the girl's ride home all along, but he wasn't able to do so. Misty even offered him money, and he still refused. This lined up with what Diana knew of the night's events. During the interview, Trina said that she didn't trust Reuben and confirmed Diana's theory that Reuben had a crush on Misty. Trina also shot down any rumors of trouble between Misty and Diana, saying Misty was happy. As this was going on, Bober was sentenced to jail time for his drug offense and would go on to serve 14 months behind bars. At this point, the Puyallup and Kings County Police Departments were cooperating with each other to solve this case and to bring Misty home. Sergeant Carver spoke with Ruben's boss, Frank Rodriguez, and learned that Ruben had been telling people that he knew where Misty's body was buried and that the investigators were six miles off. It should also be noted that Rodriguez had shared this with Diana because he felt that the police were not doing enough. When questioned by police, Reuben said Misty did call him that night, but he couldn't give her a ride home because of gas and that he quote unquote said those things about her body to get people off his back. End quote. This makes no sense. No one actually admits to knowing where a body is buried unless they have something to do with the case. That's not something that you joke about. Yeah, that's more of an attention seeking behavior. We see that when people aren't involved in cases and they want attention. He also told police that he didn't remember much about that night because he suffers from blackouts. He told police that on the day of Missy's disappearance, he had driven to his grandmother's house, which is a 100-acre farm in Buckley, Washington. Note that he tells the police two different stories. Reuben's grandmother's farm was only eight miles from where Missy's clothes was found, and this property was never searched. They also never searched his car, and Reuben eventually sold his car to a wrecking yard where it was destroyed. Around this time, it came out that Trina had lied to the police about walking home the night of Misty's disappearance. In reality, Trina's 23-year-old boyfriend or friend, depending on who you talk to, Michael J. Reiner, picked her up, and Trina had offered Misty a ride with him too, but Misty refused because she didn't like Reiner. Um, I just want to say, if you're a 23-year-old and you're dating a 14-year-old, that's disgusting. Whether, you know, man, woman, whatever. If you're a teenager and an adult is taking interest in you, run. You're not special. They are grooming you to believe, you know, that they're special and they're preying on you. So Misty possibly did have a reason to not really like Reiner. At 16, Reiner had been accused of abducting and raping an 11-year-old girl at knife point, but charges ended up never being filed. He also had mutual friends with Anna and Kim, the Puyallup girls who had been killed in the previous years. It's unknown if Misty and Trina knew any of this information about Reiner. In April of 1993, Reiner sold his car unknowingly to an undercover cop, who investigated the car, but it's not known if they found anything. Um, I'm going to assume that they probably didn't find anything because nothing was ever made known to the public. He later passed a polygraph test and was no longer considered a suspect. Uh, This was disappointing for the police because they were really dead set on Reiner being the perpetrator, or at least knowing what happened to Misty that night. Puyallup police were still calling Misty a runaway, while King County police seemed to be taking this case more seriously. Almost a year after Misty's disappearance, the Puyallup police finally interviewed Reuben's roommate. He again said Reuben went out after Misty called, but this time he also said that Reuben had a 13-year-old girlfriend over who got angry when he spoke to Misty. He also added that Reuben had a short temper and that he didn't return home the night Misty disappeared until around midnight. But unfortunately after this, Misty's case lost momentum and nothing new was noted by police, any police department, between 1994 and 2004 other than a handful of sightings that went nowhere. Diana had Misty declared legally dead in 2000 and Bober actually convinced a local church to hold a memorial service for her for free. Despite this, 
Piala police still firmly believed she was a runaway, just as they had when they began investigating Misty's case eight years earlier. No forensic testing that has ever been done was able to link Misty or Kim and Anna to the Green River Killer or anyone else. Uh, I guess it should be noted that Gary Ridgway was found to be the Green River Killer in 2001. So just a year after Misty uh, had her death certificate uh, given to Diana. To this day, no arrests have ever been made in relation to Misty Copsey's disappearance. Okay, so before we get started talking more about suspects and theories, uh, just to note that these are all purely speculative and we may never know what really happened. All persons are presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. There is really only three suspects that anyone has connected to Misty's case. I'm not going to include Bolver because he has a strong alibi of getting assaulted on the night that Misty disappeared. I'm also not going to include Gary Ridgway because he also has an alibi for that night because he was working and he has never admitted to killing Misty. He allegedly claims that he will never take credit for any murder that he didn't commit. And keep in mind, this man has murdered 40 to 50 people, so... It's definitely not a thing of him not wanting to add one more. First, there's Michael Reiner. Reiner, again, was Trina's 23-year-old boyfriend, who was accused of having a violent sexual past, but no charges were filed, and he was never found guilty in court. He told the police about this incident quickly after they asked to interview him in relation to Missy's disappearance. The Puyallup police were dead set on Reiner and believed that after he dropped Trina off, he went back to the bus stop and took Missy. Then there's Ruben. He has given Diana and the police so many different stories at this point, it's really hard to know what to believe. No one can really confirm where he was on the night of Missy's disappearance. He said he didn't have enough gas to drive Missy home, but he had enough gas to make it 60 miles round trip to his grandmother's house. It just doesn't add up. Since then, he was accused of raping a close friend of Misty's in 1996, but the girl refused to press charges. In 2006, his wife requested a domestic violence protective order after she said that he threatened to burn her house down with their children in it. In either 2015 or 2017, the Bizarre Daily News published an article from someone claiming to be a relative of Rubens. Though the article is no longer available on the website, there have been several follow-ups. They essentially state that Ruben is a violent individual and that it's almost an open secret that Ruben and one of his uncles is connected to Misty's disappearance. They said that the police have reached out, but that they're hesitant to trust them as they didn't do much with the information related to Ruben initially. There's also a third potential suspect that police never looked into. Robert Leslie Hickey was a convicted rapist. In 1993, he forced a teenage girl into his car, raped her, and threw her down a ravine, leaving her for dead. She miraculously survived, and Hickey was convicted. The abduction took place just five blocks from where the anonymous TV show caller reported seeing Misty, and at the time, he drove a red Camaro. Remember, there were a few um, pieces of red paint that were found on Misty's pants. After serving five years in jail, he went on to attack and attempt to sexually assault a 24-year-old woman, and he's currently serving a life sentence without parole. Uh, I'm not sure why the police never interviewed him after, you know, all of this craziness, but we'll get into that a little later. Um, so, Del, what do you think could have possibly happened to Misty? Well, I think that, unfortunately, the most likely scenario is that Misty was killed by Ruben. When looking at any case, someone whose story keeps changing seemingly to cover up lies makes me, makes me question. He lied about having enough gas, which was a stupid lie that can be easily uncovered. He shows evidence of mistreatment of women and a complete disregard for other people's personal safety. I don't believe Misty was a runaway at all. This is totally speculative and I'm not making accusations, but I do believe Ruben is the most suspicious in this case and so does Diana, Misty's mom. There is so much abnormal activity around him. He's lied so many times. No one really knows where he was when Misty disappeared. And Ruben even admitted to not knowing what happened from his blackout. But then he's also admitting to knowing where Misty was buried. So how can both of these stories be the truth? And I don't think police really looked into that. 
Uh, they never searched his grandmother's property, and they missed their chance to search his car. He's one of the last people to have spoken to Misty, and the police didn't talk to him until five or six months afterward. Uh, it's not known if they ever spoke to his grandmother or his uncle. I really don't think Misty is related to Kim and Anna's murders because her body was never found and theirs were. Um, I do see a possibility of maybe Hickey being involved. Um, he seems very opportunistic. And if Misty was desperate enough, maybe, you know, he offered her a ride and she got in his car. Uh, Diana did say that Misty was smart, but she was a little naive. And she was a 14-year-old girl. A lot of 14-year-olds, boys and girls, are naive, unfortunately. Um, so this case makes me so angry. And I want everyone listening to be just as angry as Dell and I are about this. This was truly an injustice that was done to Misty and Diana in regards to this case. Yeah, this case really highlights what happens when the police jump to conclusions and they jump to suspecting something that is not bore out by the actual evidence. It also shows what the police does with cases that involve victims that they don't seem as qualifying of sympathy or support. And unfortunately, that was the case with Diana. And her being a victim in this case, she lost her only daughter. And because of prior acts that she apologized for, that she was upfront about, the Puyallup police was just like, well, no, we don't like you. Therefore, we're not going to treat your case with the utmost importance that it absolutely deserves. Yeah. And addiction by no means means that someone does not deserve justice and that they are a liar that shouldn't be taken seriously. We've seen this in other cases, something from someone's past totally invalidates their future. And that's not fair at all. And we see this across so many factors in life where people treat people that have committed crimes, especially felonies as someone that should be cast away from society, never to be heard again. What happened to you know, you do the crime, you do the time. But after you do the time, you should be able to continue and to live a life just like anyone else. Now, of course, I'm not talking about certain type of criminals. If you are a sex criminal, for example, I fully think that you should be on a registry. You should stay away from schools. We should make sure that you're not recommitted. But the toughest crime that she committed was welfare fraud. And she op- she owned up to it. She told the office. And I don't want to defend, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. But she was a single mom. She was in her 20s. She had a daughter. I don't know what kind of job she was working, but she clearly felt like she needed to be doing what she was doing to help her daughter out. It really seems like her daughter has always been at the forefront of her mind. Right. And maybe the real question that we should be asking is, why did she feel that she still needed to be on welfare when she had a job? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a another thing. I mean, even in the 90s, I don't know what minimum wage was then, but so many working class people, you know, they can't live just off of minimum wage. Going off of not being taken seriously, runaways children and teenagers that are marked as runaways really were not taken very seriously during this time period. And I'm not really sure if they're taken seriously now. Um, The 911 operator that told Diana that she needed to wait 30 days to report Misty missing. I've never heard of that. That is not true. If anyone, everyone listening, if anything ever happens to you, your family, your friends, You do not need to wait 30 days to report someone is missing. You don't need to wait 48 hours to report someone is missing. You tell the police as soon as you find out. It's We need to advocate for ourselves, and that's unfortunately true because we can't always trust the police to do what is best for us. And I think this idea that a minor can just run away and the police say, well, they ran away, therefore we're not going to try to find them. It's ridiculous. I know when I was growing up, if you didn't go to school, they were coming to find out why you didn't go to school. But Mm -hmm. you're telling me a child, and Misty was a child. 
ran away and now was just like, well, she didn't want to be with you, therefore she doesn't have to. Like, where's the welfare check on a child? Where's the caring that you have a minor just out? God knows where. Like, where's the concern? Yeah, and if you really do believe someone is a runaway, so let's just for a second say that she is a runaway, you would want to investigate where has she made any claims about, I want to go to Seattle, I want to go here, I want to go there, I'm interested in doing this, and this is how I'm going to get there. You should be investigating these claims made by someone. Missy never said she wanted to run away. Missy didn't say she was unhappy at home. Her mom had actually just bought her a new stereo and they were really bonding. So why would she just want to up and leave? Something that really frustrates me is that the police always want to say someone is a runaway and they don't listen to the family and friends that know this person best. And let's even play the she was a runaway and Diana was a bad mom. Let's play pretend for a bit because we know that's (laughs) false. Wouldn't you as a police officer, what you would want to investigate this parent? Because that's child abandonment, right? If your mm-hmm. child is just gone, that's child abandonment, that's child endangerment. There's so many different matters that the police would get involved in if this was truly a runaway case. So even if you didn't believe the fact that Misty loved being home, she loved her mom, her mom loved her. There were so many different avenues of investigation, and they decided to take none of them. Yeah, I I truly don't understand why they would not talk to Trina and Ruben sooner than they did. The last two people to have seen and talked to her, why wouldn't you investigate them? It makes no sense. And I think it's also a thing of, like you had said earlier, that time gave Ruben time to destroy his car, which could be alleged to be a very important part of this case and the vehicle in which Misty got in when she went missing. Yeah, there's so many interesting theories with cars. You know, these cars seem to kind of point to everyone. We have Ruben that sold his car. We have Reiner that sold his car. And we have Hickey that had a red car matching, possibly matching the paint chips that were found on misty's jeans it's one of those cases where you kind of look at the outside and think oh my god like everyone is a suspect like everyone makes sense but if the police had really searched more into these people and interviewed them and interviewed people around them i do think that this case would be solved it was also the thing of them trying to close the case all the time. I don't think I've ever seen a missing persons case that gets closed this often. It was mm-hmm. like they were saying, I give up repeatedly. Yeah, and I really don't get that. I think it really does all just go back to Diana and they look down on her. She was a drunk. She was from a trailer park, possibly. I don't want to make assumptions, but maybe she was low income. She was a single parent household. And they were just not fond of her. And I do also think she was pretty, like, fervent in what she was trying to get done. And maybe the police felt that she was stepping on their toes a little bit and they felt challenged and didn't like that. They obviously felt challenged by Corey Bober. And look what they did to him. I mean, if he is... I'm not going to get into the whole, you know, war on drugs. But if he's a drug dealer, that is, you know, a law that he's breaking did they maybe go after him harder because of what he was trying to do with this case? Maybe. You know, Bober is such an interesting piece in this case. I know we were pretty harsh on him, but he deserved it because he did some really creepy and suspicious things. But I will say I respect the fact that even when it was going to put his freedom in jeopardy, he still continued to fight for Misty and continue to fight for Diana and making sure that Misty's case didn't go unheard. I agree. And we said this before. I really don't think Bober is a suspect. I don't think he's in any way involved. I know people get weirded out by the fact that he brought them to the spot where Misty's pants were found. But remember, he messed up in knowing what side of the road it was on. If he really was after all of this fame and glory, do you think he would have made himself look like a fool by doing that on purpose 
No, not at all. And listen, everyone makes mistakes. Exactly. <laughs> okay. And I also think it's the thing of we had brought this up before of the possibility that they gave him incorrect information or incomplete information yeah we can see that they have something against him they have something against diana in this case so who knows i I really think that is a possibility and i think that another one of their issues was the lack of cooperation that they show with other police forces yeah i mentioned before i really think this was like a lot of pride in this Puyallup Police Department. I know that the King County Police did take this more seriously. They did have more experience. The Green River Killer was active in their county, but they should have been working. Everyone should have been working together much sooner. I don't know how many people work at these police departments, how many were working there at the time. It could have been an issue of that, but there's a missing girl. She's 14. You need to find her. It's your job. Why aren't you doing your job? That's what it comes down to. And I think that's why a lot of people get frustrated with police because it seems like they're not doing their job in so many circumstances. And they do such a selective job yes. because I think that there's an age factor that we should also consider when it comes to this case. Could it have been Misty's age leading the police to write her off more easily than they could have done with a younger child? Yeah, so Del, the age-related idea makes me think how when children go missing, you need to find them in those first, like, 24, 48 hours. The first 48, I'm sure a lot of people know, is that crucial time where there's fresh evidence, there's, you know, a lot of movement and activity going on for children and adults, uh, you know, victims of crimes. And telling someone to wait a week or 30 days, what's going to be left at that point? And when you think about eyewitness testimony, which is already, you know, filled with uh, inconsistencies and other issues, you want to talk to witnesses as close to the event you want them to remember as possible. And so 24, 48 hours, you have a better chance of actually getting the correct information. And going off that, too. Why wouldn't you want to talk to the right people? I know I keep saying I can't believe that they didn't talk to Trina and Ruben, but I mean, Sergeant Carver went out of his way to go to the school and talk to Misty's classmates. You couldn't talk to her friend who lived a town over. Come on. Like, I don't understand. And for him also to go as far as saying on a radio station that her mom knows where she is and she's fine. There was no evidence of that other than these girls. And he blows my mind. There's a lot of things I could say about him, but I'll refrain. But I still have heard that he thinks Misty is a runaway. And uh, yeah, Sergeant Carver believed that once he heard that Misty's jeans were found, that Diana and Corey Bober had planted them there. And what was the evidence that would show him that Other than, you know, Diana possibly being this drunk mom that didn't care about her kid, it it goes back to that again. I don't understand. And I mean, if she he's going to say that she's a runaway, too. If she's a runaway, she just threw her pants and her underwear and her socks off and ran away in her shirt. I don't think there was any reports of like her clothing from home missing. So what is that? I, I don't understand. You know that I like to make different connections between cases. And as you were describing him, Fire Chief Morris kept <laughs> popping into my head. Like, just woeful incompetence and not caring about actually doing a good job. Yeah, and for those who don't know, Fire Chief Morris is from our Missing Solder Children case. Go listen to that if you haven't already. It's a good one. Yeah, it's it's the willful ignorance, incompetence, whatever you want to say that leads to these cases not getting solved. This article that was written by a possible relative of Ruben, I know it's weird. The initial article is not available, but there's follow-ups to the article that give some details about, you know, these family secrets. And I, I mean, if this person really is related, why and that really says a lot to me because why would you just want to go out and blame your family for something like this? 
Exactly. We've definitely seen a thing where the people that are the most protective are the family, especially the family that you choose to have with you. So I definitely think it's something where the police should have gave some type of credibility to the stories as told by people that were related to Ruben. Yeah. And it's a shame because in those articles, like we said, the person is kind of hesitant to talk to the police the police have reached out to them but they're hesitant to talk because they know how the case was handled before right and they don't feel like the police is gonna have any protective factors you have to think that Ruben is a violent individual yeah so Ruben does have a violent history since Misty's disappearance two years later he allegedly raped one of her friends who was still a teenager uh in 2000 I think he was arrested on theft charges and then in 2006 like we said he's threatening the mother his wife and the mother of his children and his children that he's gonna burn their house down with them in it and it seems like in every interaction that he has with people except allegedly the uncle that committed the crime with him, it always leads to that person being victimized. Once again, please make sure that you're advocating for yourself and your loved ones whenever a crime has been committed. You should never 100% put all of your trust and faith in outside authorities because while a lot of them try to do the best job they can, you might run into a Sergeant Carver. And if you do you're definitely going to make sure that you are collecting evidence that you're talking to people and that people know what happened. Sometimes the most powerful thing is just having people know. So make sure that you're advocating for yourself and your loved ones. Yes, definitely. That's one of my personal goals with this podcast, just getting advocacy out there for people, knowing that it's unfortunate that we have to rely on ourselves, but sometimes that's all we have. Um, if anyone has any information in regards to Misty's whereabouts, please call the Piala Police Department at 253-841-5415, the Pierce County Sheriff Department at 253-798-7530, or the King County Sheriff's Department at 206-546-6730. So that wraps up this week's case. Please let us know what you think happened to Misty Copsey. Thank you for listening. Make sure you click the subscribe button. You can find us on all of your favorite podcast platforms every Wednesday with a new episode. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at Crime Corruption Cocktails and on Twitter at Charade Inc please consider donating to our Patreon. This will help us get better equipment and bring higher quality content to you. We appreciate any donation you make. This is Dell and Jenny signing off. Stay safe.